It is my great pleasure to introduce Kaushik Basu. Uh, he is the Karl Marx, Karl Marx Professor of International Studies. I always like to say that because Karl Marx, can you get it? <laughs> Except that it's spelled with a C and it doesn't have an X. Uh, okay. And he's at Cornell University. Uh, he's the former chief economist of the World Bank. He's the former chief economist of the Indian government. He's the current president of the International Economic Association. He's written many, many books, including one that we should have available here. It's called The Republic of Beliefs. It's on the role of law for economic welfare and economic development. Uh, he, and, he, and he's a former teacher, or he's a teacher of many well-known Indian economists, just so you know. He taught at the Delhi School of Economics. Uh, he has a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics, where he studied with Amartya Sen, who continues to be an important influence in his life. He is a huge influence on my life, by the way. So I learned economics first from him, because he taught the best microeconomics course that I think was taught, uh, that, 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 that I think was taught at the University of Delhi. Um, uh, so he started out as my teacher. And then, uh, and then he became my boss at the World Bank. When he was the chief economist, he hired me as his deputy. And I had a great three years with him. Uh, and now he's a friend. So he's being demoted in my, in my world. <laughs> you start with teacher, boss, and now friend. Uh, I, don't, I think he'll stop associating with me because he'll get demoted more. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but uh, he, he, uh, he is also one of the nicest people in the world, I always say. The thing is that he's not one of the nicest people in his own family. That would be his wife, Alaka, who was supposed to be here, who's also a professor at Cornell, but she can't be over here. But over to you, Kaushik. You have about half an hour, and then maybe you can take some questions. Yep. Thank you so much for doing this, Kaushik. Thank you very much. Um, Indrabi, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, the Duke Center for International Development for organizing this. Uh, I feel very bad that I could not be there in person uh, because apart from the lecture, there is the interaction with people and the coffee and the cookies that you were doing just now, which I'm all missing out on. But uh, good to be there virtually. And uh, Indrami, thank you very much for organizing the conference and this particular session where I'm speaking. I should tell you, since Indrami just mentioned the name of my chair, the Karl Marx professor, C-A-R-L-M-A-R-K-S. When I give lectures in India and I get introduced or written about, the spelling difference does not show up in the Indian uh, way of writing. So it is treated as a chair named after the Karl Marx, which, that is, which is not the case. Uh, my plan uh, in this lecture is to give you a little bit of a backdrop of development economics, how it came to be where it is, and then look at the very, very contemporary challenges that we face today, which is forcing us to rethink a lot of what is the core of development economics. Development economics started pretty much with economics itself. In 1776, um, when Adam Smith publishes his Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith's concern is development, the progress of nations. And you have to remember, uh, the British economy and even the European economy in 1776 is into its first decades since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So it's not nowhere nearly as advanced as these economies would become. So the concern of economics is the concern of development, which is the concern of the region from where economics is emerging. This is true almost all the way till 1848. I'm thinking of John Stuart Mill's publication in famous uh, political economy book in 1848. This is mainstream economics inseparable from development economics. This begins to change in the late 19th century with the rise of the marginalist school and the neoclassical school. I did a little bit of research looking for dates to which we could pin down some of the key changes. 
and there is some fascinating evidence. On the 1st of June in 1860, Stanley Jevons writes a letter to his brother where he says that for the last several months, I've been working on a new model of economics and it is so different what has struck me that, and I'm quoting, I cannot now read other books on the subject without indignation. So Jevons had made some stunning discovery in the previous couple of months. When did he do that? There are other people who have written on this now. It's most probably on the 19th of February in 1860, because there is a diary entry that Jevons makes that all day he has been at home working on the economy. And he says, arriving at a true comprehension of value. You will recall that at the start of economics, one of the major concerns was value. Why is this particular object of a certain value and this particular object of a different value? What is it? Is it the content of labor as lots of economists thought? What is it that gives value to an object? It struck Jevons that actually what gives value is nothing but ordinary people with diminishing marginal utility trying to maximize utility and choosing what they like. It is their preference which gets reflected in value. This led to the neoclassical school or the marginalist school rising with several prominent writers, Leon Walras, uh, Jevons himself, a little later, Alfred Marshall, and the new school erupts in a new form of modern economics. So if you have to choose a day to celebrate modern economics, I would call 19th February the modern economics day. We should declare that a modern economics day and celebrate it. But one upshot of this rise of the marginalist school and the neoclassical school is development economics takes a backseat. Economics now bifurcates. The concern of development falls away from the limelight. Attention is now on the general equilibrium system, the economic system, the formation of prices. And I feel that for economics, this is a major breakthrough. Modern economics is what it is because of the rise of the marginalist and neoclassical schools. So our indebtedness to this intellectual breakthrough is immense. That is not to say that there are no shortcomings. There are major shortcomings and there are major changes we need to make. But this is the core of the economics discipline. Development economics as we know it arrives on the scene in the mid 20th century. It is one country after another becoming independent, breaking out of its colonial grasp. And these independent nations must form their own policies, think in terms of how to grapple with the modern world. And we see the rise of development economics with important contributions by Ragnar Nagse, Paul Rosenstein Rodan, Arthur Lewis, Albert Hirschman, all from roughly 1950. Uh, Nuxay comes a little bit before that, Rosenstein wrote down a little bit before that, but up to 1960s, 70s, you get these major breakthroughs coming and modern development economics is formed. My own learning of development economics took place pretty much in the field. Uh, I, I was not trained. I was trained in regular microeconomics, did choice theory, but learned a lot of development. And I'm grateful that I learned much of my development economics, not from books, but from experience out there in the world. I remember one particular incident, which for me was a huge learning. You know, there is a, a body of literature in economics, right from Adam Smith through Marshall, through Stephen Chung, um, later on, Joe Stiglitz, Avishay Braverman, a whole lot of people contributing on share tenancy as a form of contract used in rural farming areas. And the whole logic was that share tenancy is irrational on the part of the landlord. You never give out your land on a share tenancy contract. So if everybody is rational, share tenancy should not even exist. 
And the existence of shared tenancy is a sign of people's irrationality. I remember in the late 1980s, with students from the Delhi School of Economics going for field research in Eastern India, uh, in the state of then Bihar, now it's a part of Jharkhand, sitting in a little tea stall and talking to a relatively poor landlord. He had a vision and eye problems, was virtually blind, and he was telling me that he had given out his land on a share tenancy contract, not a fixed rental contract, but a share tenancy contract. And I thought this is a great opportunity. I got chatting with him and gently I was trying to tell him about Adam Smith's theory and how he is wrong. Alfred Marshall's theory and how he is wrong. The modern work of Stephen Chung, uh, Joe Stiglitz and others, and how he may be making a mistake by giving out his land on share tenancy. I remember this poor landlord remained completely unimpressed by these very, very prominent thinkers. And he gave me a reason as to why the best policy for him was share tenancy. It had something to do, he was saying it in a relatively inchoate way, but it had something to do with limited liability. And I remember I wrote up a paper on limited liability and the existence of share tenancy. I published it. And this was purely out of the field. Some early economics with experience in the field, which led to a paper. And later on, I would get a similar experience of economics, and I will come to that a little bit. When I joined the Indian government as chief economic advisor to the previous prime minister, to Dr. Manmohan Singh, um, in 2009, I would be learning a lot of development, development macro policy, once again, not from books, but from the experience of policy making, and it has been an extremely enriching experience. Let me tell you that development economics, the early work from Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill, then the absence of work, but once again from 1950s roughly, uh, Arthur Lewis, Albert Hirschman, Ragnar Nagse, these were huge contributions. And I feel it will be wrong for us today to belittle this early theoretical work, which plays a very, very major role. And I will give you just now examples as best as I can in a speech like this without a blackboard of how pure reason can give us very deep insights in development. But there was this rise of the theoretical school from the mid 1950s and in recent years, over the last, say, 15, 20, 25 years maximum, there is also the rise of data, small data being done in laboratories and randomized control trials, and very recently, big data, massive data sets being analyzed, and this is continuing to enrich development economics. And in recent years, Indermeet will remember this very well because we in the World Bank were active in this, bringing behavioral economics and psychology into the field of development. These are all recent entries and all continuing to enrich the discipline. But let me give you an example of pure reasoning, theory being brought to a very, very practical area of economics. This is in the early 1990s. 1990 to 1991 saw economic reforms in India which were just hugely important. The contemporary India that we see today, among the fastest growing countries in the world, happened because of some key reforms that took place from 1991 to 1993. We also owe a lot of credit to the early foundations, the political foundations of a democratic society, of a secular society open to all kinds of people, but I'm concentrating on economic reforms which took place from 1991 to 1993. One particular reform, which has to do with nothing but plain simple reasoning, is the following. You know, in India, if you look at the foreign exchange reserves, the total amount of foreign exchange that the central bank in India has, Right from, say, 1970 to 1971, if you look at this data, you will see that the Indian foreign exchange reserve is roughly $5 billion. 
If it falls to $3 billion, we declare it a balance of payments crisis. If it goes up to $7 billion, we sit back feeling very comfortable that good times are here. In 1991, India hit a crisis, a roadblock, because of the first Gulf War remittance money, which used to come in in big quantities from the Middle East, stopped coming to India. And that immediately meant that India had a balance of payments crisis, a massive one. The 1991 crisis reached a point where India at one stage was in a situation where it had enough foreign exchange reserves for a, if need be, if the reserves had to be used for another 13 days of imports. And then imports would have to stop. Many things happened over there, but one of the things was had to do with why did India for 20 years have so little foreign exchange reserves? One mistake that uh, India was making and many other countries made was to reason as follows. Since India has so little foreign exchange, India had very strong rules, not letting people, corporations, firms take out foreign exchange. So you could not take foreign exchange out of India. It's very easy to see that if you don't allow individuals or firms to take foreign exchange out of the country, the first thing you will do when you come into India is not bring foreign exchange into the country. Yeah, I will just put this one off, that's fine. Uh, not let foreign exchange out of the country. Uh, so what did that do? That meant that ordinary uh, um, people would not bring foreign exchange into the country, knowing that once you bring it in, you can't take it out. Firms earning foreign exchange abroad would not bring it, in, bring it into the country. People were beginning to argue, and I would write occasional newspaper columns at that time, that we must allow people to take foreign exchange out of the country. And for between 1991, actually the decision was taken in 1991, in the middle of the crisis, that we have to allow people to take foreign exchange out of the country. In the beginning, there is always a risk because in a country that never allowed people to take foreign exchange out, if you allow people to suddenly take foreign exchange out, there will be a rush of money going out. So India went to the IMF, got a cover from the IMF that IMF would stand by and foreign exchange rules were eased up. It was not made that you could freely take any amount out, but capital controls were released were made easier and people were allowed to take foreign exchange out. There was a lot of nervousness in the beginning, but what happened over the next 20 years was amazing. And if I had put up a graph, this is one of those graphs where the graph tells you the full story. Up to 1991, the foreign exchange reserve in India is almost a straight line, roughly $5 billion flickering. Over the next 20 years, that $5 billion goes to $300 billion. It's an exponential graph. A change in regulation done by using nothing but a little bit of reasoning made a dramatic difference to the kind of world we are living in. And policy, similarly, it's very easy to make policy mistakes. A small mistaken policy intervention at a macroeconomic level to do with foreign exchange or with mon money can do huge damage to a country. This needs a little bit of training, of course, but with that training, common sense, clear thinking, and you can bring in policy to make big changes. Anyway, for the world, I want to spend a little bit of time on our contemporary world. So let me jump and move ahead uh, to the current world and the challenge that that has thrown up, the challenge that we will live with. Now, if I may give you one, again, without a picture, but I can virtually describe the picture to you, which again tells you a little bit about theory and gives you a very clear picture of what happened in the Eurozone crisis. You know, up to 1999, up to 1999, if you look at the borrowing cost of different Eurozone countries, countries that would become a part of Eurozone later on, so, Greece borrowing money would have to pay a very high interest rate. Portugal borrowing money from ordinary people, the Portuguese government, would have to pay a very high interest rate. The Germans would have to pay a, pay a low interest rate. France may have to pay a reasonably low interest rate. Germany would have to pay a very low interest rate. 
And why was that so? And it's very easy to see. People realize that if you lend money to Greece, there is some risk of default. Whereas with Germany, the risk, risk of default is close to zero. And you want a higher interest earning from Greece to compensate you for that risk. So there were these different interest rates. The graph of borrowing looks amazing from 1999 and certainly from 2001. Suddenly, all Eurozone countries are being able to borrow money for the same low interest rates. This goes on from 1999 and completely from 2001. 2001 is when Greece joins the Eurozone. All the way up to 2008, all these countries are borrowing money at a very, very low interest rate. And then once again, the interest rates fan out. It shoots up for Portugal, um, uh, Greece, initially even Ireland. Um, uh, it goes up somewhat for Italy. It comes down slightly for Germany. What's happening is clear. The market has made a mistake, had make a, made a mistake. A realization comes in 2008 with the Lehman crisis that when you lend money to two Eurozone countries, though now it's all in euros, it is not as if the Eurozone is, is responsible to pay you back. It is each specific government that you have given money to. It's that government that has to pay you back. And here there is a bigger problem. Earlier, those governments could print their own cash and pay you back. They can't do that anymore. They have, don't, don't have that option anymore because they don't have their own currency. Once that realization came in 2008, you realize that if you lend money to Greece or if you lend money to Portugal or if you lend money to Italy, it is the responsibility of those countries to pay you back. So the risk is still there. And the risk may now be bigger because those countries can't even print money to pay you back. And interest rates diverged once again, but a huge amount of damage had been done during this period from 2001 to 2008 because there had been over borrowing by a whole lot of Eurozone countries who were very, very big in debt. From 2008, we've had a series of crises. First, the subprime crisis in the United States, then the sovereign debt crisis. Then Indermeet will remember very well when we were in the World Bank. The commodities price cycle was beginning to change and there was once again a crisis. What we have seen from 2008 to now is a very protracted crisis. It's not as deep as the Great Depression, but it is very prolonged. One crisis after another has been hitting us. What is it that is causing this? Allow me five, 10 minutes maximum on this, and that's it. I'll be very happy to take some questions. What could it be? I have a view that beneath all these differing different crises is something larger that has happened in the world. And that is what making us more trouble prone. What is this larger problem that has happened in the world? Well, problem is not quite the right word. Technology is changing. Technology has always changed from the Stone Age, but occasionally the change becomes faster and novel. There are different forms of changes that take place, and maybe we are in the middle of one of those sharp different change. And indeed, there are two different forms of technology that you can see. One is labor-saving technology that has long been there. But there is now another new technology, which is labor-linking technology, which is tending to make the labor market of the world a common pool. So you can be sitting in Addis Ababa or in uh, uh, um, um, Bangalore or in Manila or in um, um, any country in uh, Nairobi or Dar es Salaam and working for consumers in Durham or New York or Ithaca. Uh, you could be working for a company that is located in Tokyo or Sydney or somewhere else. The labor market is becoming a common pool because thanks to digital technology, there's a lot of work that you can do sitting in faraway places. All this is causing a huge strain on the world. 
And this strain on the world is showing up in economic crisis one after another. For rich countries, and even for upper middle income countries, this new technology is causing a strain which is visible in data over the last 40 years. If you take the national income of United States, if you take the national income of Japan, Australia, European Union countries, any of them, literally any of them, and take the fraction that is earned as wages. So the part of the GDP or the national income that is earned by workers as wages, over the last 40 years, this is dropping steadily. And you can understand the anguish of the middle classes, the working classes in these countries, upper middle income countries, that their income share is steadily going down with rental income earned increasing, profit income increasing. And I'll come to what can be done about this in a moment. But this is also creating opportunities in emerging economies, and we must not grudge them. These are poor workers sitting in Tanzania or Kenya or Ethiopia or Bangladesh or Brazil who can now link up with the world and work there. This is a huge opportunity and over the next 10 to 15 years, after that, the, the global problem of automation is going to affect all countries. But in the meantime, there is a huge opportunity. The emerging economies that can provide electricity, digital connectivity, you also need law and order because you have to sit in some office and work. You need drinking water, you will need water where you're sitting. Few basic things. And you can be sitting in faraway lands and working for companies and customers in distant places. That creates opportunities. And you can see in the rise in growth rates in unexpected places, Ethiopia is growing very rapidly. Uh, Rwanda is growing very rapidly. Bangladesh is growing very rapidly. A lot of it has to do with globalization and the advantages being conferred by globalization. This will become a challenge later. Let me quickly turn to rich countries. The big mistake is to take a protectionist view and say you want to stop connections with the world, whether in terms of goods or in terms of labor, as is happening, for instance, in the United States. You can see similar sentiments in Britain through the Brexit move. It's happening in a whole host of countries. This is unfortunate, and I think in the long run, it will hurt the very countries that are putting up tariff falls. One example that I take, a striking example historically, is if you go back to the early 20th century, World War I, the start of World War I, up to then, Argentina had grown for 40 years at roughly 6% per annum, which was an amazing performance. It was the China of that period. China grew for 30 years recently at roughly 10% per annum. Those days when growth used to be much lower, Argentina had done it for 40 years. Argentina was among the 10 richest countries in the world. The mistake that Argentina made at that time, there may be many mistakes, but two we can identify is that it gave too little importance to higher education, research, and creativity which in the United States already was being given a lot of importance in the early 20th century. Number two, there was a rise of jingoism and xenophobic nationalism, which led to literally tariffs being doubled. By, the, by 1933, tariff rates had gone sky high. Goods were being blocked, people were being blocked. And after that, Argentina, after a brief pickup in growth, began to stall. And it's nowhere now. now on the global scene, the way it used to be in the early 20th century. The way to deal with this, yes, globalization does need checks and balances and regulation, but the kind of protectionism that we are seeing in these countries is not going to work. What do you do? We do need a lot of novel forms of thinking. Go back to the Industrial Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution started and over the first 50 years, yes, it was increasing productivity, but it was increasing child labor. Child labor in Britain in the early 19th century, late 18th century was high. The incidence of child labor was higher than in many sub-Saharan African countries today. There were working classes working 12 to 14 hours a day, leading miserable lives. 
What changed it was, first of all, there was novel thinking in economics. You have to realize that the bust of modern economics, which I already referred to from 1776 to 1848, from Adam Smith's publication to John Stuart Mill's publication, takes place in the midst of this crisis of the Western world, crisis brought about by a rise in technology and production. We are in a similar situation. We need a lot of novel thinking in economics, but we also need novel regulation. That period of the Industrial Revolution saw a lot of new regulations, which today looks to us like completely normal. The income tax as a regular form of taxation started in 1842. When that happened, there was a hue and cry that how can you tax people's income? That was started. There were labor regulations brought in all the way from 1802 with Sir Robert Peel's Factories Act through a series of Factories Acts. And in the end, the world came out better off than what looked like in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, hugely better off. Technology had improved and we had learned to live with that technology. We are at one such moment where a lot of development economics is development economics with globalization of a kind we've never seen before. The right response to that is not to go and try to block that globalization, but to think of novel ways of uh, intervening, novel forms of regulation, and in emerging economies, the provision of certain basic requirements for industry to flourish and to link up with the world. Let me stop with this now, and uh, I'm presuming there will be a question and answer, and if I can hear your questions, I'll be very happy to, through the answers, maybe go into some of the policy challenges that we face now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kashik. So I know that we have about 10 minutes for questions, and as we start to get, as we start to sort of collect our thoughts and think about the questions that we want to ask Kashik, and I think we can ask him about anything. Chinmar, please go ahead. So I thought I'd just tell you a short story about Kaushik, a short story, right? So when Kaushik joined the World Bank, after a year or so, he asked me to work with him. And so, of course, I was going to say yes, because he had been my teacher. Uh, and then somebody told me, do you, do you actually know anything about the guy? I mean, outside of the fact that he's a really good teacher of microeconomics and that kind of thing. So I said, ah, the good idea. You know, I should check up on him. So I'd, I found a book by him, right? I found a book. And it was a really nicely written book. It had very nice articles, serious articles about economics and so on. But interspersed among the articles were jokes, right? So, I, uh, so the, the uh, joke that I remember was that he, he said something about that, that, that he was visiting with a friend. He was visiting the University of California at San Diego, right? And they could never, so they started to, uh, they, they had just got there and they were trying to figure out how to pronounce the name of the place. So they go into a fast food place and they ask the guy um, who was across the, uh, across the counter who happened to be a fresh immigrant essentially. And, he, and they say, so you know, how do you pronounce the name of this place? And so the guy says, well, that's easy. Uh, first you say burr, then you say gur, then you say king. Okay. What they were trying to find out was uh, how to pronounce La Jolla, just so you guys know. <laughs> I know Jeff would love like this joke. Okay, Chinma, you go first. So I, 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 yeah. I mean, as soon as I read that joke, I said, I'm, so I, as soon as I read those jokes, I said, I'm working with this man. He has a good sense of humor. Uh, good, good morning, morning professor, professor. Uh, this, this is relating to a point which you had raised earlier regarding uh, the the shortage of foreign exchange with uh, reserves which we are having in india this is an india specific question so what is your view at present when the reserves have breached 400 billion dollars and we are continuing to invest in in us securities which are yielding a fraction of a percent of uh, return do you still think that countries like india and other um, fast growing or emerging market uh, economies should continue to invest in these kind of securities and not spend a portion of that in developmental related work? Thank you. Um, 
uh, two things, um, the $400 billion of reserves that India now has, it had reached $300 billion uh, uh, roughly by uh, um, yeah, 2010. It's now at uh, $400 billion. First of all, I do believe that the whole world uh, has um, reserves which are just far too big. China has roughly $3 trillion. India has four, $400 billion. India is also among the uh, seven or eight biggest foreign exchange reserve holders. There ought to be a bit of a global coordination in bringing down these reserves. One reason why you hold such reserves is because there are other countries holding big reserves and they can interfere in the global market. Now, I have been in favor of using a part, a tiny part of the foreign exchange reserves in a, keeping it in a sovereign wealth fund. I know that usually sovereign wealth funds are created through unexpected short period incomes. Uh, the good example is uh, Norway with its North Sea oil. It did extremely well by creating sovereign wealth funds. And I believe that a country like India could uh, do that. But uh, uh, the bulk of the currency has to be kept very, very safe. I mean, you don't want a crisis in terms of the reserves. China, you will have to recall last year, China's now at roughly $3 trillion. About a year and a half ago, China was at $4 trillion, and it ran down about $800 billion for interventions in the exchange rate market. So these are currencies that can be needed in a very big way. So you have to do it very carefully and cautiously. A small amount has to be kept in terms, I would believe, for developmental projects. But the key figure for this has to be the central bank. You cannot interfere with the central bank and take away its autonomy and force it to put money elsewhere. Disasters have taken place on macroeconomics in the past when that has been done. Thank you, Kaushik. I think that's the answer Chinmay wanted to hear because he works for the Reserve Bank of India, by the way. Okay, good. Go ahead. Who's, who's next? Albert, please. Hi, good morning. Oh, sorry. Good morning. Can I go next? Yes, of course you can. Uh, good morning. I'm an, um, I'm, my name is Preeti. I'm an alumna of the Sanford School. I guess uh, from your talk about the role of technology and uh, its implications on job creation, I just wanted to uh, try and understand if economists um, are thinking about the implications of the leap that you mentioned. So with um, uh, the coming of driverless cars, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, and Internet of Things, how, like, how do you think uh, economists and people like us who work in development, like, what should we be doing to, you know, plan for the next 50 years? Yeah. Uh, Preeti, if I got your name right. So, um, over the next 10 to 15 years, I feel for emerging economies, the policy is pretty much what they have done, uh, which is uh, provide the infrastructure, provide an in a regulatory environment which is friendly for enterprise, for creativity, and there's still a lot of space. But you're asking for a 50-year uh, future, and I do believe that another 10, 15 years, the, this rise in technology, which is displacing labor, is going to affect the whole world. And driverless cars will come in. There will be a whole lot of areas where conventionally you, you need people to do it. You will not need people to do it. That in itself is not a crisis. What becomes a crisis is every time you displace workers, if those wages become profits and rental, then you are going to impoverish the working class across the world. And that's not a viable universe. My own view is that a part of the profit and rental has to be owned collectively by society which means that a fraction of the profit, a part of the shares has to be owned by people so that when every time you displace a worker, that wage must not immediately convert into profit in someone's uh, pocket. It has to be distributed more widely when workers are part owners of this. Take an extreme case. If you one day develop a machine that entirely displaces regular work, so that human beings are left to do, they will do things, but things which they find joyous, nothing that is painful. They, some will go fishing, some will go playing sports, some will read philosophy, some will do painting. Machines have taken over the entire world. If that means that a small segment of people who own these machines are getting the entire income, 
then that is disaster. So there will have to be interventions in terms of profit sharing, intelligent interventions. We do know of bad interventions in the past which have damaged incentives so big that productivity has gone down. But I believe we have to go into some kind of a profit sharing world for the world to survive this technological rise. And once again, I'm not completely sure as to what the nature of the details, the minutiae of the intervention should be. But I again look back at the 19th century, 18th century and look at regulations that were brought in, the changes that were brought in, which today look completely normal, but which were dramatic at that point of time. We are at one such juncture today. Thank you, Koshik. Albert. Yes, uh, Koshik, this is Albert Zufak. Um, great to see you. And, uh, Still uh, remember the, the trip we took to Ethiopia, and I'm sure in my next book there will be jokes from that trip as well. Um, you probably figure out where those jokes would come from, but uh, I really enjoy your 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 lecture. Um, you know, two points: one on the uh, uh, the digital revolution, and I, I completely agree with you. The pace of uh, technological change is definitely faster than we have seen in the past. I completely agree with you that um, you know the concerns we are hearing are probably over exaggerated because we are not focusing that much on the creative destruction aspects of technology. We are more focusing on the labor destructing part of it. Um, and I share your 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 view as well that um, it's providing a huge opportunity for developing countries, especially those in Africa, where you could. Uh, you know, increase incomes without going through the whole uh, tragedy of, of immigration and provided that we, uh, we have the right digital infrastructure and the basic uh, physical infrastructure in these countries. Question to you on this point is, um, where do you see the potential, you know, uh, pitfall of this movement? Number of people are now arguing, uh, using the old literature of skill based technological change, that we may be actually moving into a phase where the digitalization would actually widen inequalities within developing countries. What's your view on that? Second, uh, second is on the, uh, 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 the need to manage uh, Forex more wisely and your suggestion to set up sovereign wealth fund. I for once tend to believe we need to be more cautious when that advice go to uh, low and poor uh, African countries, for example, where the institutional setting is not adapted, where uh, governance and corruption uh, you know, issues are, are quite high. And, uh, you know, and probably we should make a distinction between uh, a stabilization fund and a sovereign wealth fund or uh, a fund for future generation. And I think that uh, you know, nobody would quarrel the idea of having a stabilization fund to defend the currency in, in, in those situations. But the idea of sovereign wealth fund, frankly, is one that is quite questionable for our countries. And last point, last point, um, as you were describing the situation in India in, in, in 91, I was just thinking of Zimbabwe, where I was two weeks ago. And this is the perfect example of how a bad policy intervention can actually ruin the, uh, the whole uh, situation. And you know, more recently, the decision of the finance minister to just, uh, you know, uh, to exit the hard pack without proper preparation and when the country has only two weeks of foreign reserves proven, proved to be extremely disastrous. So, thanks. Koshik, there are three questions over there, but this is from the World Bank and we know that they always over deliver. We, are, oh, 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 we only wanted one question and we got three. Yeah. Let me merge them and give an answer. Albert, um, hearing your voice, I'm really feeling awful that I could not be there in person. It's bringing back such wonderful memories of my World Bank days, uh, especially with Albert. It was a magical couple of days in Ethiopia that we had spent. Thank you for your question. So very, very quickly. Um, I, I, yes, I do believe that if uh, we allow, uh, we have to allow the, uh, um, the technological revolution. First of all, even if we try to stop it, we can't stop it. And the technological revolution is increasing our GDP enormously, increasing the scope for higher production. So there should be no effort to stall that. But if it continues in the same way, after 
10, 15 years and maybe even sooner, inequality will begin to rise within these countries because uh, regular labor is going to be displaced. The kind of labor for which there will be demand is creative labor. So there may be huge amounts of population that will be involved in research. And you know, um, this is a, a kind of audience where I don't have to explain this. Research is one of those activities where a large body of people will do it. One will get a hit and that's going to give another round of productivity boost. But research is also not meant for everybody. So it will be a relatively small group that will be doing research. There will be a relatively small group that owns the machines and the technology that will be earning incomes and the masses will be in huge poverty. So I do believe that if we allow this to progress the way things are going, there will be a crisis that will emerge even at the doorstep of developing countries. So we will have to think in terms of novel regulations. We will have to think in terms of diverting labor to creative work, which means school education will have to change very rapidly so that larger and larger number of people and children learn to do creative work because the non-creative work is going to be taken out of their hands and will be done by machine. So you need a revolution in education. You need a revolution in the way income income accrual gets managed. You don't want to destroy incentives. At the same time, you do want a part of this huge income that will be delivered to go into the pockets of ordinary people across the country. So there is a big agenda ahead of us. It's a bit like, you know, climate change. Um, for a long time, we felt that we don't need regulation when people lived in small communities. But now we realize that for climate, you do need certain global level interventions, novel interventions. And I feel likewise over here. And very quickly, let me tell you about the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Yes, I'm putting this forward very cautiously and I'm simply recalling what I had suggested a long time ago for a very small amount of money from the foreign exchange reserve being kept under the control of the central bank. You don't want to give this control to politicians who are going to run this, to run it like a sovereign wealth fund. But you have to be careful, as I just said. Also, what you mentioned, that when you let the peg go, when you change the rules of foreign exchange control, capital controls in a developing country, you are giving the example of Zimbabwe, there are huge risks over the first two years. The reason why India succeeded with that in 1991 was really just very professional policymaking. And I can say this um, uh, um, impartially because I was not involved in this at all. There were a whole set of policymakers around the finance minister who crafted a brilliant set of interventions that we were freeing up the market in some ways. We were removing certain kinds of capital controls at the same time, we were bringing in other forms of supports and bulwarks, and then India did it, and there was success out of that. And there's a very big risk if you don't do this right. Thank you. I better stop on that, just in case someone else wants to ask something. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Thanks. So uh, just to re return to this question of uh, India's foreign reserves. So I, I presume India accumulated all these foreign reserves because India didn't want the exchange rate to appreciate, right? Um, so is it your opinion as an economist that uh, it's preferable to accumulate these excess reserves and then invest them in various ways that are uh, have a huge opportunity cost rather than simply allowing the exchange rate to appreciate? You know, India's foreign exchange reserve accumulation was not done um, uh, explicitly at all in the early days for exchange rate management. It was just that the amount of foreign exchange that started coming into India, not immediately after the reform. The reform takes place in 1991. 1993, the crisis abates. India actually pulls out of IMF support because it, India does not need that anymore. And the reserves started coming in in a huge flow. When that coming began to come in, picking up the same percentage that India was picking up earlier to keep in the Reserve Bank of India stock was causing the reserves to rise and the reserve rose astronomically to $300 billion. And after that, India has intervened relatively little in the foreign exchange market. Every now and then it does, and it does, but it is not the kind of intervention that had taken place in China, which took it to $4 trillion. 
So the accumulation has been very big, but for different, done in a very, very different way. You know, it's slightly too technical to go into. My own view is, uh, and I've got a technical paper on this. Uh, there was one which I wrote in uh, the World Bank with uh, Aristoman Varudakis, uh, which is a paper which is available on the World Bank website, about the right way for central banks to intervene. These are called conditional interventions, where you don't intervene by saying we will just buy up some uh, amount of foreign exchange, but do it at different rates, different exchange rates, you do different amounts. But I'm explaining this rather poorly because I can't do this without a blackboard. One more question, because people are getting hungry, Koshik. Uh, so we have uh, we, 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 uh, we have a question from Ivalo Izvorsky, who you might recognize. Hi, Koshik. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what, is, what is your sense about the lessons from India's recent development or India's rise for, for Africa? We've been discussing Africa today, and so... I mean, we, we've talked with Indermit in the past that when India was growing at 5 6%, people would describe that as a complete failure. And so the, the, the standards or the demands of, of politicians and the private sector were very high. When Africa now is growing at three, three and a half percent, barely above population growth, we often tend to, to look at this much in a much more positive light. What, is, what, what are the lessons? What, what, what could one learn from, from India? People do learn a lot, at least they say from Korea, from China, but perhaps India is a much more relevant story because it went through really a long period of low growth, uh, central planning, and so forth. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ivalo, I'm, I'm discovering I've got a good memory for voices. So good to hear your voice. Uh, the 3.5% you just mentioned, the Africa growing incidentally, in India we used to have a name for 3.5% growth. Because India grew roughly at that rate for several decades after independence. It used to be called in India the Hindu rate of growth. And the story was that it must be written somewhere in the scriptures of the land that this land is never going to grow at faster than 3.5%. So from what you say, Africa is now growing at the Hindu rate of growth. Um, so uh, within Africa, I should point out, there's a huge amount of vari uh, variance. Uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, um, uh, Ghana, these are countries that are actually growing very, very rapidly among the fastest growing countries in the world. Lessons from India. The lessons from India are pretty conventional lessons. I, in fact, find lessons from China harder because China's development was based on policies which are so very different from what we have seen in other countries, whereas for India, it was more conventional policies. India had two points of growth change. One took place after the 1991 to 1993, the reforms. And I believe that there are two important things you need for a country to take off. You need good infrastructure. The state has to come in to provide that. And you need regulation, but intelligent regulation, not ham-handed regulation stopping creative activity. From 1991 to 1993, India undertook a lot of regulatory changes, which actually gave the country a big boost. The next big growth, growth spurt in India, India's biggest growth spurt took place from 2005 to 2008, when India was growing at roughly 9.5% per annum, it has now come down. India is now growing at roughly 7% per annum, but it had gone up to 9.5% per annum and steadily over a three, four year period. Two, three things were driving. First of all, the reforms had played a major role. Then a bit of old fashioned economics is important and that's a reminder in the case of India. Savings and investment, we know from the time of Harold Domar and later of Robert Solo and Swan that savings and investment rates being high is an important prerequisite. We had seen this in the East Asian countries and we saw this in India. In India, by 2003, India was saving and investing more than 30% of its national income. That was the kind of rate seen in East Asia never seen in India before. And by 2005, India was growing at 9.5% per annum. I believe that also contributed. There is another thing where I don't quite know how this is a lesson, but this played a role in the case of India. The globalization, some countries have benefited from globalization. Some countries have been hurt by globalization. 
India falls squarely in the set of countries that benefited from globalization. The digital links with the world that India had gave India a big boost. Bangalore was flourishing, Chennai was flourishing, a whole lot of southern Indian cities which were very well linked up digitally with the rest of the world were flourishing. And you get a big spurt of growth taking place through the benefits of globalization. The lesson out of that is, and this, um, uh, Albert may remember, this came up several times during our visit to Ethiopia, that African countries have to work very hard in providing very good digital linkages so that people can sit in small offices distributed in this country and work for the rest of the world. So you need the infrastructure, power, digital connectivity, and you need law and order, uh, non-obstructive -obstruct regulation. And India really is an example of a country that has benefited by many of these uh, moves. And it was growing at a remarkable rate, though it has slowed down somewhat recently. Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you very much for three things, actually. The first one was thank you very much for trying to get here yesterday and um, in spite of the snow there. Uh, thank you very much for talking to us today and succeeding in, in starting us thinking about many of the things that are happening around the world today. And the third thing, which you probably don't know, is that you've actually helped us set up the next section really well. The, the, the next session is going to be on India and many of the questions that you were asking Kaushik uh, and some other questions that you haven't been able to ask, you'll actually be able to ask the panelists in about an hour. Uh, so we will now break and we were going to uh, start eating lunch, Kaushik, and we'll discuss your ideas in your absence, but we'll miss you and Alka very, very much. Uh, we will reconvene here at 1.30, at 1.30, guys. Yeah.